In this video, we're going to look at inverse functions. Let's take a function of x. We could have, for example, the f of x is equal to 3x minus 1. This is a linear one-to-one -one function. If we restrict the domain, we could say now that x will be equal to 1, 2, 3, and 4. So all I'm doing is taking now integer values. If we did a quick graph of this, it would look something like so. So a nice straightforward linear function, we would now have values in the domain of 1, 2, 3, and 4, and they would give rise to values in the range. So we would have now from 1, so 1 would be just here, so that would be there, 1, and now 4. So not massively accurate, but we could say now y is equal to the f of x, and that's our function right there. If we wanted, we could show this now using a mapping. So let's look at the mapping. We would take now values in the domain and map them to those in the range. So if we took one, let's put one here, we would have two, we would have three, and we'd have four. So if I take one, three lots of one minus one is two, three lots of two minus one is five, three lots of three minus one is eight, and then we're going to have three lots of four minus one is 11. So this is x, or if you like, the domain. So this is the domain, and this now is the f of x, or we could say the range. So we're now mapping one value in x to one in y. So let's go ahead and put our arrows on. So our arrow can go just there. One will go to two, two will go to five, and then three will go to eight, four will go to 11. So that's what we have, and that's a nice, straightforward one-to-one -one function. What we want to do is find a function that undoes this process such that each value in the range is mapped back to the original value in the domain, the domain and that value only. So let's look at what we want to do. We want to now go backwards. So I want to take now two back to one and one only. I want to take five and take it back to two and two only, eight to three and three only, and then finally 11 back to four and four only. This is what we call the inverse function. And with the inverse function, the range of the original function becomes the domain of the inverse, and the domain of the original function becomes the range of the inverse. When we're looking to find an inverse function, the original function must be a one-to-one. -one. Quite clearly, this linear function is a one-to-one. -one. We can see it by its graph. If not, we need to restrict the domain such that we can find an inverse. In general, the notation that we use for the inverse is f to the negative one of x. So we've got now values in the domain, and then we will map them now to the inverse function. So let's go ahead and look at the process that we can use to find the inverse. So what we do is let y be equal to 3x minus 1. We interchange x and y and set about making y the subject. So we have x is equal to 3y minus 1. So all I've done is swap the x's and the y's and I want to make y the subject. So adding 1 to both sides x plus 1 is equal to 3y, and dividing both sides by 3, we've got x plus 1 over 3 is equal to y. At this stage, we change y for f to the minus 1 of x. This is the inverse function, and we can say this is x plus 1 divided by 3. So if we look now at the domain, the domain is the range of the original function. So we can now say x at this stage, x will be equal to 2, 5, 8, and 11. We can say that the range, and this is just writing it down here, we can say that the range, which will be f to the negative 1 of x, will be equal to the original values that we had in the domain of the function. So 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this is absolutely vital. When we have now the inverse function, the domain and the range change over. Another key feature of the inverse function is if the graphs are on the same scale, the graphs will be a reflection in the line y is equal to x. So that's what we have, and then we would reflect this now if we were asked to sketch the graph. So we let y be equal to the function, 
we swap the x and the y and set about making y the subject and then use the notation f to the minus 1 of x is equal to x plus 1 over 3. We change the domain and the range. So let's move this on and look at another function. So let's take another function of x. Let's say this time the f of x was equal now to x squared minus 1. And this time what we're going to have, let's say x is going to be equal now to, we'll take minus 1, we'll take 0, we'll take 1, and we'll take 2. Now straight off, if I sketch this, you can see problems are going to arise. One of the most important things we need to ensure is that we've got a one-to-one -one function. Now if I just drew this for all values, we'd have something that looks like so. So there's our parabola, and we've got this point here, 0, comma, minus 1. Now, I've defined the function for values, and I'll just get rid of this part right here, for now negative 1. So if I put negative 1 in, I'm going to end up with 0. This at the moment is not a 1 to 1 function. So let's put minus 1 on there, and let's put 2 just here. Now, let's look at this as a mapping for these values right here. So if I map this now, we would have a domain, and we would have a range. So this is going to be the f of x. So if I take minus 1, if I take minus 1 from here, when I now put this through the function, that's going to give me 1. 1 minus 0 is going to give me now 0. If I now take 0, taking 0, I'm going to have now 0 minus 1, which is going to give me minus 1. If we now look at 1, 1 goes in and 0 is going to come out. So we can see now that in the range here, we're mapping to two different values. That's perfectly fine. This now is simply a many to one function. So that's perfectly fine. The problem comes when we try and find the inverse. So let's go ahead now and put two in. If I put two in, two squared minus one is going to give me three. So I've taken x, this is my domain, so my domain values are uh, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And then we've got here the f of x, or if you like, if y was equal to the f of x, we've got y, and this now is the range. So we can see that each value here gives rise to one and one only y, which is perfectly fine. That defines it to be a function. And then we can put these on, so 0 goes to minus 1. We've got now 1 goes to 0. And then we've got 2 goes to 3. But what if I wanted to reverse this process? Let's consider trying to go the other way. So if I try to go the other way, let's take 0, for example. If 0 is equal to now x squared minus 1, then x squared is equal to 1. So x is going to be equal to plus or minus 1. So if I was trying to find the inverse here, and this was my domain, this is giving rise to two different values. And we can see that just here. We're going to get now on here one and minus one. So if I now did this, I can move that here like so, and this would be my mapping. So this is what we looked at before. So we can see negative one and one point to the same value. The issue comes now when I try and reverse this process such that a value in the domain, remember the domain is the range, the domain of the inverse function is giving rise to two possible values in the range. So this would be, let's put it just here, f to the negative 1 of x. This is going to be now the range, and this is going to be now x, or the domain. So if we've got the inverse, we switch them over. And we can see the problem is coming here now, but 0 is giving us these ones. Negative 1 gives us naught. That's perfectly fine. But if we then looked at 3, if we had now x squared minus 1 is equal to 3, then x squared is equal to 4, and we can see that x would be equal to plus or minus the square root of 4, which is 2. So this time we can see that it's going to map back here, but it will also map now to minus 2. To get over this, we restrict the domain of the original function. Often we can do this by a sketch and seeing quite clearly the minimum point is here, or we can complete the square. So on this one right here, for me now to find the inverse function, what I would have to do is say now that the f of x is equal now to 
x squared minus 1. Now, I can make it 1 to 1 at any point beyond 0. I don't have to make it 0. I could say I'm going to start here. I could start here. But as long now as this is going to pass, and we'll just get this up, as long as the function in the area that I pass now, this horizontal line, is going to cut once and once only, that now will give me a 1 to 1 function. So we can see at this point right here, it's not. We've got many values going to one y value. So we can restrict the domain. So in this particular case, what I'm going to say then is x will belong to the real. So x is a real number, and we can say that x will be greater or equal to 0. So if I did that now, the portion of the graph I've got is this part right here. So we know that when we find the inverse, we're not going to have the issues now of mapping back 0 to minus 1, as we've not defined now minus 1 to be in this domain. So that's what we do. So let's go ahead now and look at finding the inverse function right here. So what we've got is the following. We could say now that y is equal to x squared minus 1. If we now make the swap these over and say that x is equal to y squared minus 1, and we set about making y the subject. So we've got now x plus 1 is equal to y squared. When we square root both sides, generally we get plus or minus. For this to be a function, we determine this to be the positive root. So we'd have the positive root of x plus 1 is equal to y. And we discussed this in a previous video. So we could now say the inverse function f to the negative 1 of x is going to be the square root of x plus 1. And that is the positive square root. So let's go ahead now and draw this up. If we drew this up, what we've got now is the original function. So the original function is going to look something like this. And that now is y is equal to x squared minus 1. Or if you like, the f of x is going to be equal to x squared minus 1. That's what we have. Now let's consider this graph right here. This originally, if we have a root of x, a positive root of x, it would look something like so. This now has moved 1 to the left. This is a horizontal translation. So we're going to end up with something that looks a touch like that. So it won't go down like so. Let's just make that uh, look a bit flatter. There we go. That's what we'd have. So this is what we've got. We've got these two graphs. So this now is y is equal to now the square root of x plus 1. Or we can say the inverse function f to the negative 1 of x is going to be equal to the positive square root of x plus 1. Now this is a reflection in the line y is equal to x. Assuming now that my uh, scales on here, my uh, axes are accurate. So what we've got then is this point just here. This point is going to be 0, comma, minus 1. This is going to be now minus 1, comma, 0. So we can find these points of intersection here. Quite clearly, we could label this one up right here. This one, as we've defined it to be greater or equal to 0, this is going to be 1, naught, and this is going to be 0, comma, 1. In general, if we have a point a, comma, b on the original function, we have b, comma, a, on the inverse. We're swapping these around and reflecting it now in the line y is equal to x. So I've managed now to find an inverse given that we've got this domain restriction where x is at least 0. One of the most famous functions you'll see, and it's inverse, we'll just sketch it here, is the exponential function y is equal to e to the x. So if we have now the exponential function, we've got now y is equal to e to the x. And with any exponential function, it will look something like so. And we can say now y is equal to e to the x. This point here is going to be 0, 1. Its inverse is now y is equal to the natural log of x, or log base e of x. And this point is going to be 1, 0. So y is equal to the natural log of x, or log base e of x. And we would go ahead and just put this on and reflect it like so. So that's another main feature of the inverse function. So we see now that the domain of the original function becomes the range of the inverse. The range of the original function becomes the domain of the inverse. And now we have this line y is equal to x. And we have a reflection just here. 
If we look at the domain of the exponential function, it can take any value along the x-axis and it gives rise now to values that are going to be strictly greater than zero. e to the x can never be equal to zero. So if I looked now at the range here, and I'll just draw this on, if we looked at the range of the exponential function, it's going to be all values greater than zero. If we consider its inverse now, we've got now the domain is going to be all values greater than zero, and then its range is going to be the domain of the original. So we can see now that the range is going to be all real values. Now in terms of the, the log uh, function here, if we got the natural log of x, this is going to come down and down and it will gradually tend to positive infinity incredibly slowly in the same way that the exponential function gets very big very quick and then gradually tends to the x-axis right here. And that's what we have and that's a good example now of a well-known function and its inverse. Okay, let's look at one last thing. There are some functions which we say are self-inverting, such that we have now the f of x is equal to its inverse and vice versa. Another result of this now is if we have the f of f of x, this gives us x. And often you'll be asked to show this. So let's now take, uh, let's say we've got the f of x is equal to, now let's go for x over x minus 1. And we would want to show now that this is a self-inverting function. So what we would do is write y is equal to x over x minus 1. We would swap the y's and the x and set about making y the subject. So x would be equal to y over now y minus 1. So multiplying both sides by y minus 1, we've got x multiplied by y minus 1 is equal to y. If we expand this out now, we're going to have xy minus x is equal to y. Adding x to both sides, subtracting y, we've got xy minus y is equal to x. Factoring the y, we've got x minus 1 is equal to x. And then dividing through, now we can say y will be equal to x over x minus 1. And then we can see from here that swapping the notation, the inverse is going to be the original function. So this is self-inverting. So for example now, if we had the f of f of 3 was equal to 3, then we would have now a self-inverting function. It's sending it one way and it's essentially taking it back. So there's a brief intro to inverse functions. So let's recap. The inverse function will undo the original function. The original function must be a one-to-one. -one. If it's not, look at restricting the domain to make it one-to-one. -one. The domain of the original becomes the range of the inverse. The range of the original becomes the domain of the inverse. When we sketch these on the same scale axis, the graphs are now a reflection in the line y is equal to x which we've just seen, and also we have now these self-inverting functions where the f of x is equal to its inverse such that we can write the f of f of x is equal to x. In a later video, we'll look at some exam style questions that focus on the inverse, but hopefully for now that's given you a good starting point.